let me just give a, a little bit of background. I uh, sometimes think of GIA as, as this three-legged stool. So certainly it's, it's not a, a research institute uh, at, in, in its entirety. It has a, a research leg, uh, it has an education leg, and uh, we have a, a laboratory that tests and grade gemstones. So, and most, most of the research done uh, at GIA is um, applied, so to solve uh, gemological issues that exist uh, in the industry. So um, today, uh, first, we'll talk about uh, synthetic diamonds um, and the uh, recent changes, and I would say recent in the last uh, 20 years, but more, more recently in the last few years. And I'm, I'm sure you've probably heard or read much about this, and it's been in the uh, public media quite a bit uh, recently and, and how it's going to impact uh, natural diamonds. But I think he'll focus on the identification, so we. Oui. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a really honor to have this opportunity to interact with the Mirage Society of America. I'm on and off with this society, started from 25 years ago when I bought this, and it's, it's a tie. So I didn't use too much, uh, today I put it down. Um, diamond is the most important gemstone for the jewelry industry for many good reasons. Um, for consumers, they know many reasons why they want to buy a diamond, but one thing they probably don't care is they have a lower mental inclusions. And uh, the big difference between geologists and uh, our consumers or gemologists or us in the jewelry industry is uh, geologists really want to find inclusions and we really want to get rid of the inclusions. <laughs> <laughs> in last few just as Tom mentioned, in the last uh, five, ten years, we have a huge progress in synthetic diamond technology. So now it's about uh, three to five percent of uh, diamond in the market is a synthetic diamond. So it creates a lot of concerns to our industry because our industry is, a is a purely built up on this uh, trust of this uh, material. So how to separate them, or how to the position in our industry is quite important. So today I'm going to use this opportunity to update you what the current status of uh, synthetic diamond and some ideas or some challenges we have in the gem lab, how to separate them. To identify synthetic diamond, we study natural diamond. If we don't know natural diamond well, we don't know how to separate them. Diamond is probably the most heavily studied mineral for uh, good reasons, and in, I think it's from 1950s, when the microbeam technology is of, uh, become available, so have a huge progress in this area. So now we know um, most gem diamonds are formed in the lithospheric mantle, but one piece is missed in our jewelry industry is uh, for this uh, commercially important diamond, like a very big type 2A diamond and the type 2B diamond, we don't really know how much about it until recently because some reason is uh, for research institutes, uh, universities, they probably have good interest in studying this commercially important type, uh, gem diamond, but they don't have access. But for these people who own these diamonds, they probably don't have interest in studying them at all. So it's uh, until uh, kind of recently when GIA is probably in this uh, unique position, we have access to these diamonds, and we'll have, we also have the interest in this area so we started some study, and we published some paper here, so now we know this commercially important type 2A diamonds are from the transition zone, more pro probably, and 2B diamonds from the, the lower mantle. One interesting discovery is, and it's probably late discovery, and for the type 2A diamond, and recognized, probably crystallized from uh, liquid metal. So it's kind of an interesting discovery, but when we talk about a synthetic diamond, it is just uh, you know, 60, 70 years ago, we already used this technology to grow diamond, and the SPHT technology is just a kind of a delayed discovery for almost uh, 70 years. Um, diamond industry is a very simple uh, structure. It started from um, diamond exploration, mining, cutting, and before diamond reached the retailer, it's, oh, sorry. It is us in Gem Lab. Gem Lab, our role is to protect the consumers 
and meanwhile to support the jewelry industry. So we uh, <coughs> breach uh, we breach the uh, jewelry industry outside jewelry industry cutting industry before they reach the, the retailer to protect their interests. If we look at globally how many diamonds we mine every year, it is only together it's about a, it's about a 40 tons. It's not a lot of a diamond mined every year globally, but in the world every year we consume some more than 2,000 tons of a diamond for many, many reasons. So it's obviously the big gap to fill the gap, it is a synthetic diamond. Synthetic diamond, this technology actually started development from 1950s. What I'm talking today is of only the specific synthetic diamond, the single crystal uh, synthetic diamond that, is, that has been used for the jewelry purpose, for, for the jewelry industry. So I'm not going to cover all the synthetic diamond technologies. Here the first diagram of uh, carbon, temperature, pressure. So we all know very well Graphite is stable at a low pressure, diamond is stable at a high pressure. And the, this is ferric mantle diamond, here's about the pressure and the temperature condition. Two technologies, HPHT synthetic and the CVD synthetic, two technologies. HPHT technology basically is a mimic of the natural diamond form condition. Of course, the natural diamond could form goes through all of this area following the geothermal. But HPHT synthetic is mimicking the natural diamond forming technology, uh, the conditions. Uh, CVD actually is a green diamond almost in the vacuum at a very low temperature and very low pressure. So to, it's, a, it's a magic to grow single crystal diamond in the graphite stable region. So I'm going to, uh, so both technologies start from uh, 50s. It is until recently, like 10, 15 years ago, we see a huge progress in the technology that decrease in the cost. So finally this product become possible, available for, for our jewelry industry. So I'm not going to go through the history about it, but I'm going to show you what these technologies have achieved in producing different type of quality and size of gem diamond. So I start from HPHD synthetic, of course, to generate a very high pressure, like a 5, 6 GPA, we need some press like this. And with the assembly at the middle, here's a cubic press. Inside the assembly is something interesting with a different components, very well developed technology from 1950s. It didn't change much, it, it, even until today, it's just tried to perfect it to make it more effective and more economy to grow more diamonds. It's a temperature gradient technology and graphite here, or diamond powder here, or seeds here, separated by metal. And at a very high temperature, this is going to dissolve, the carbon is going to dissolve into the liquid metal, and because of the temperature gradient, carbon gets oversaturated over here, has a diamond seed, and it's formed a single crystal diamond. So this technology has been continuing even to today. A few simple observations. The diamond cannot be bigger than the furnace. So if we want to grow bigger diamond, <laughs> we, need a, we need a bigger furnace. And uh, to reduce the cost, we need to grow more than one crystal. So, so even we need a bigger furnace, a bigger furnace, bigger press. And to create a lot of technology challenges of how to control the temperature and how to stabilize the temperature. But anyway, there's some great progress recently. So I'm going to show you some uh, Beautiful pictures of a diamond. So we know HPHD technology is very well used from very beginning to grow yellow diamond. It's because of it has a few ppm of uh, ice and nitrogen that, uh, sub uh, that uh, substitute carbon uh, atoms. In 2000, we just show you three yellow orange diamond, 2005, 2018, <coughs> sorry, 2019. The size goes from about a 4 carat, 10 carat, and a 20 carat. So it can grow very high quality, uh, beautiful diamonds. The biggest crystal, single crystal diamond produced by HPHT synthetic is already over 100 carat. And this technology has many potential applications. Of course, the jewelry industry is the easiest one for them to cash their investment. And Yellow diamond is good, but it's not the best. Not a, it's important, color is very important for jewelry industry, of course. Yellow is good, but the colorless one is very important. It's probably the most important color, and how to remove the 
nitrogen from these crystals has been struggling in the industry for quite a while. It's until recently, and this is a Russian company called New Dime Technology in St. Petersburg that successfully <coughs> achieved this uh, product that nitrogen is almost entirely removed and produces a beautiful colorless diamond. And in addition to that, they can even dope some boron into it to produce the beautiful type 2B blue colors. So they can grow multiple crystals, up to a dozen, up to a few carats, but they keep updating their own record, as it's the biggest one, uh, uh, colorless can go up to 10 carat. The blue 2B stones can go to six carat after the faceting. The technology can be, was, <laughs> has been easily implemented in China. So we just talk about a China from China. Now I'm gonna talk with you about a diamond from China. And uh, China has more than 10,000 press like this. So that has been, part of that have been used to grow um, diamond crystal, single crystal like that. So now very large amount of almost unlimited amount of HPHD synthetic diamond of different sizes are available from China for the jewelry industry. One interesting thing I want to talk about is what we call the many diamond. Many diamond like a 0.001 carat, 0.002 carat. It's a very, very small stone, but these stones are very common. If you could look at some jewelry, you see this, this ring has a 70 small stones surrounding a big diamond out of the middle. The many stones, natural diamond, a year we cut about a 1 billion many stones to the, to the market. But um, traditionally, none of them will be tested by jewelry industry, by the gem lab because of the obvious reason the cost is very high to test these small stones. And the Chinese market, the gorillas, uh, develop a very interesting technology that can grow HPHD synthetic diamond, use this uh, industrial diamond as a seed, about a one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters, after cutting can be one to two point, and, sub and this stone got introduced to our jewelry industry and it created a lot of concerns. So here's the rain we find, we test it, and among the 70 small stones, and this one, is HPHD synthetic, so it created a, a some concerns of how to identify them. So with that, I'm going to move to CVD synthetic diamond. CVD synthetic diamond grow at a very low pressure, close to vacuum. In the vacuum, the device is much simpler because I don't need a very high pressure, I don't need a high temperature. This is just a reactor in GI laboratory, and the GI actually is the only gem lab we are growing CVD diamond. And in the reactor, introduce two types of gas, dominated by uh, hydrogen gas with a little bit of uh, methane gas. And this gas started a chemical reaction with microwave plasma, as you can see the plasma ball here. And the carbon eventually deposited on this diamond substrate. This substrate usually is in one zero zero orientation, layer by layer, and it become a single crystal diamond. And this is probably one of the best single crystal CVD diamond we produced in GI laboratory. It's about a nine by nine millimeters in size and close to six millimeters in thickness and close to eight carat in, in the weight. How to grow CVD diamond, single crystal diamond in graphite stable region is something very uh, interesting. And one explanation is that outmost diamond surface is terminated by hydrogen atom that prevented this carbon convert from diamond structure to graphite structure. Just a similar to uh, HPHD synthetic for production purpose to reduce the cost, we need to grow more crystals in one run than to grow individually. So now in the industry, they, are, they achieved they can grow a couple of dozens of crystal in one run with a speed probably up to 10, 20, 30 microns power and still keep a very good quality of the crystals. In the CVD factory, this is what we already see, uh, synthetic diamond crystals and still with some uh, long diamond carbon at the rim. Let me quickly show you the history of a CVD single crystal diamond for the jewelry industry. We, in 2003, for the first time, we see some single crystals, use CVD technology, very small, and very dark in brown color. 2006, it's getting much better in color, still very small, 11, 2011, 
slightly bigger size, getting close to the commercially important size, one carat, and in 2015, it is over one carat and up to three carats, colorless, near colorless. So in about 10, 12 years, made a huge progress. Now, we can easily find a CVD diamond over five carat, colorless, near colorless, and a pink orange color. This is the two crystals, and uh, I saw in Las Vegas gem show, both are in tiny colorless and over six carat. Crystal growth is a balance of a speed and quality, and of course, a, a speed and uh, the, <coughs> the cost of the quality. The higher the speed is, the poorer the quality will be. So in the reality, they grow reasonably fast and then do aftergrowth treatment to improve the color. So aftergrowth treatment uh, is a pretty important thing for synthetic diamond, of course. But synthetic itself cannot produce all the colors we want, so aftergrowth would be able to introduce other colors. So a bronze CVD diamond after HPHD treatment will turn to colorless, and some of them could turn yellow with the irradiation, could introduce a different saturation of a blue color with a multiple growth technology involved, like a HPHT annealing and plus irradiation annealing, would be able to produce all types of saturations of pink, or pink, orange, or purple, and sometimes red. Red diamond is very rare in natural diamonds, and treatments would be able to produce a limited amount of uh, red diamond. So with that size, uh, and not surprising for us to see a lot of synthetic diamond in the gym show. This is the picture I took a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, in the Las Vegas show. And with that, I just basically uh, report the, we see in the last 10, 12 years, 15 years, we see a very rapid progress in the CVD technology and the HPHD technology in producing colorless and some fancy color gem diamond. It could be small and it could be big, up to 20 carats. There's no doubt more and more synthetic diamond is going to get into our jewelry industry and how to, it's a legitimate product and a disclosure. It is very important. And for us in the gem lab, we will have a very important role how to identify these synthetic materials from natural materials. If diamond is not a cut, it's a rough diamond, synthetic diamond will be no problem to separate from natural ones. They have an entirely different crystal morphology. But in the jewelry industry, of course, every single stone is faceted and the inclusion removed, and that become a challenge. So I'm not going to talk too much about how we identify to separate synthetic stones from natural stones. Of course, a lot of important thing for us involved is uh, similarly linked, is how to separate a treated natural diamond from a natural diamond. I'm going to talk about some basic principles here. We separate a synthetic from natural stones almost entirely based on defects. And that is the defects in diamond. That includes their defect species, what type of defects, their concentration, their coexistence, and even their distribution. So I use this diagram to show some concept. The isotonic nitrogen is very common in natural diamond that create a yellow-orange color. And a lot of important defects in diamond is a natural synthetic, it is the vacancy. When the carbon atom disappeared, acid nitrogen and vacancy could become together, they become MV center, and MV center create a pink color, and also fluorescence, pink or orange. And nitrogen can be two nitrogen combined with one vacancy, is create a yellow color of a diamond, and also create a blue, or create a green fluorescence. Could be two nitrogen plus vacancy, that create a yellow color, blue fluorescence, and a four nitrogen plus vacancy, that create no color. So it's absorb, it doesn't absorb any visible light. So I just want to show you the defects in diamond. It's very complicated. We know very little of the defects, despite it's very important for us. But nevertheless, we use this material, this information, to help us to identify <coughs> natural stones from synthetic stones. So we develop all types in the jewelry industry. We use all types of technology, actually, for identification is to detect the defects in the diamond. The technology could be very simple. Looks like a fluorescence or phosphorescence. 
look at the strain or growth related to color zonation. And more and more spectroscopy technologies have been introduced to identify them. It is not difficult to identify one or two synthetic diamond. The challenge thing is how to identify all of them, identify them quickly, um, efficiently, and affordable. So that's the challenge we have, and all our tests have to be long destructive. We cannot return two pieces of stone to a client, but when clients submit only one. So we cannot damage them. So uh, for, in our spectroscopy technology, I just use one of the, show you one example, for example, 3D Raman photoluminescence mapping that will allow, in, at a liquid nitrogen temperature, will allow us to see some distribution of defects in 3D model in, in a specific diamond. And identification is more challenges more than defects itself, because sometimes the treaters will intentionally try to make the stone unidentifiable. For example, HPHD synthetic diamond shows strong blue, sometimes orange phosphorescence. It is a very important feature for us to identify HPHD synthetic. In last year, there's a publication from Hong Kong that tell us how to remove the phosphorescence of HPHT synthetic diamond without changing any of their geological feature like a color of the stone. So there are some challenges like that. It is more difficult for treated natural stones. Here I'd like, I like to use the example of a three type 2A colorless diamond to show you how we handle it. It is a natural type 2A diamond, CVD synthetic 2A colorless, and HPHD synthetic. These three stones, it's impossible to separate with the visual, like naked eyes, in, it's impossible to separate them. What here we use is uh, photoluminescence technology collect with a different laser excitation at liquid nitrogen temperature. For natural diamond, we know there's a feature we call a 560 band. We don't know what it is. We know in general it is only occur in natural diamond, and it cannot be produced in, we believe it cannot be produced uh, in laboratory or uh, it will anneal out at very low temperature. So it is an unstable center in diamond. For CVD diamond, we know when we use a 633 laser excitation, we see beautiful, strong silicon vacancy defect. It is a very diagnostic important feature for CVD synthetic. For HPHD synthetic, when we use A30 laser excitation, we see the liquid interstitial emission at 884 nanometers. Very useful features for us, but it is not conclusive. So after more careful analysis, we find the silicon defects could occur in natural diamond. It also occur in HPHD synthetic diamond. Same thing for liquid peak. Liquid defects, it occurs in natural diamond it also occur in some CVD synthetic. So I just want to show you the complicated, there's no single technology that can help us to identify all of the uh, synthetic stones. It has to be a combination of uh, different technologies. What's the most important technology we are rely upon? It's the one thing they cannot change even with the aftergrowth treatment is a diamond growth habit. Natural diamond almost exclusively grow as an octahedron. It could be, you know, the dissolution become a rounded edge to tetrahedron and to entirely um, euhedral shape, but it is dom dominated only by oxygen growth. For HPHD synthetic, it is more than one growth sector. Could it be oct could it be octahedron, cubic, and sometimes a tetrahedron. Very important feature we like to use a lot in GemLab is the different growth sectors has entirely different capability in capturing impurities. So if a diamond has color, we would see color zonation. If a diamond even has no color colorless, the concentration of a defect is still different from 111, from, one, from 001. So we would be able to see it from fluorescence, for example, or from other spectroscopy technology to detect this type of a different growth uh, uh, habit. For CVD synthetic, it grow in the 1001 direction, but it is not flat. We see this type of uh, um, terrace growth vertical and the horizontal, the rise growth horizontal. This different type of growth habit create the uneven distribution of defects and that can be seen 
in different technologies as a, what we call a striations. So when this, this feature is not a changeable, the aftergrowth treatment could change the, um, the species of the defects, but it cannot change dramatically of their distribution. So that distribution will give us information how to separate them. So let me show you a few examples. This is the HPHD synthetic diamond fluorescence image. It is excited by very strong UV, like short wave 220 nanometers. Now we see this uh, 001 growth and the 111 growth sector. They're so very different fluorescence intensity because here has more, in 111 has more lethal defects. For CVD diamond, we see a lot of uh, MV centers, the fluorescence orange. <coughs> and the red, and we see these gross striations. For natural 2A diamond, we see the beautiful 3D the, uh, dislocation network. It's a char characteristic feature of a natural diamond. They will never show up in synthetic stones. But the things are more complicated than that. For HPHD synthetic, because they use the nickel as a catalyst, but now if you look at the current HPHD synthetic diamond, so the difference is much, much more subtle because they are not using much of a liquid in it. And CVD diamond is the same thing after treatment. The pattern changes from orange to blue, and they can even grow entirely natural looking CVD synthetic diamond. So with that, I'm going to summarize my talk. It's, uh, there are, I just want to show you the significant progress in single crystal diamond using uh, both HPHT and the CVD technologies in the last two decades. And it's very important for our jewelry industry to have an accurate, efficient, and affordable technology to separate them from natural stones. And this, this separation is, a, is the many best on for us to use the different technologies to find uh, their uh, difference in lattice defects configuration. Thank you very much.